Hi everyone, this is Tina Ramirez, and I am so excited to be here with my friend, Dr. Katrina Lantos-Sweat. Uh, Katrina ha has just an amazing background. She is currently the president of the Lantos Foundation for Human Rights and Justice. It was established in 2008, um, just after her father passed away. And her father was Tom Lantos, who was a Holocaust survivor, as was her mother, or is her mother. And um, I had an opportunity to serve in the US Congress with her father, and he was a champion for human rights in the US Congress. And even one of the, the first pieces of legislation that I wrote, he ended up helping see through the Foreign Affairs Committee in the House. It was related to the protection of, of um, persecuted communities in India. And uh, eventually it passed the House and it died in the Senate, unfortunately. But, but Katrina, I'm so grateful for your father's leadership on that and just the mantle that you've taken up. I mean, you've done so much else. You were recently the both the chair and the vice chair of the US Commission for International Religious Freedom as a Democratic appointee to the commission. And you were also, um, you, you're a professor at Tufts University. You do so much. You worked on um, human rights in North Korea, and I could go on and on, but I, I've just, I've known you uh, since my time uh, in the U.S. Congress and known of your passion for human rights and your just, your fascinating perspective on the world. And I would love for everybody today to just be able to hear um, all the unique perspectives that you bring and your passion for, for religious freedom and human rights around the world. So thank you for being with me today. Well, Tina, I am really so honored to be on this program with you. And I think when it comes to passion for human rights, you take a second, uh, second seat or back seat to no one because I know so much of your work. And I, I love the name of your organization, Hardwired, because I think it speaks to the fact that there are certain things hardwired within each one of us as human beings. Um, a desire to uh, have that dignity bestowed upon us, um, recognized, acted upon, a desire that really beats within every heart to, to wrestle with some of the big questions of life, um, the meaning of our life. Does it have a purpose? Uh, what, is, uh, what is it that, that provides the values and the, the structure and the focus for our life? And so it's, it's a wonderful kind of way to think about human rights, that they aren't an invention. They are a, a a gift really that each of us is born with, um, a, a bundle of, of uh, rights and, and dignities that, that we really need to cherish and, uh, and defend. And, and I know you do a great job doing both. Oh, thank you so much. Well, you said it perfectly because when I was, um, you know, after I worked on the Hill and was up in DC, I, I, I just saw this need for setting up an organization where people on the ground that were suffering could actually have that local somebody locally that could defend their rights. And I felt there was this huge, um, just, just absence of that around the world. I mean, here in America, we have so many people that will come to our defense at an instant if uh, our rights or freedoms are taken away, but around the world, that just doesn't happen. And so I wanted to start something, but I wanted it to be really something that younger generations could say, hey, I understand that. And to be hardwired really is it's how we're made. Like you said, we're all hardwired for freedom and every person deserves it. And the freedom of conscience and belief is really one of those most valuable freedoms. And I think having gone through a pandemic in the last year, people realize it's in times of crisis that you look to your faith more than at any other time in life and around the world where people are suffering under such horrible atrocities uh, that, you know, it's like over 80% of the world doesn't have the kind of freedom that we have here in America to think and act and believe and express ourselves in the way that we do, that, that they look to their, their faith or to their, to something outside of them as the thing that gives them the ability to keep going. And so I have just been honored to be able to defend it throughout my life, but I want to talk about your passion for this because you have been a champion for this freedom and for so many other human rights. Um, and you know, most people that may, might be in the circles that I'm in may not have heard your story. And so I want them to hear. Uh, just can you share a little bit about yourself and your family and where this passion for human rights and for the freedom of people of all beliefs came from in your own life? Well, thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit of my family's background, because really I have to give all the credit to the story of my parents. Um, I'm the daughter of two Holocaust survivors from Hungary. 
uh, my late father, Tom Lantos, who was a member of Congress and actually the founder of the Congressional Human Rights Caucus. And my mother, Annette Lantos, who is still alive, lives with me, which is great, a great source of great joy and pleasure for me. But she was completely my father's partner and, um, and um, strong support in all of his human rights work. But they were young Hungarian kids during the Holocaust, um, Jewish Hungarian, and they really experienced, of course, in a very personal way, what it meant to become a hunted animal within your own country, to have your fellow citizens, your fellow, your friends, your fellow students turn against you simply by virtue of the fact that you were Jewish. But there was one um, really kind of remarkable story that came to our family from my father's um, experiences during the war. And he rarely talked about his experiences. It was a very difficult time, but this story came to us from one of his very dear friends um, with whom he had been taken to uh, these slave labor camps in Hungary. And um, these were horrible places and many, many people died there. Um, but in the particular camp that my father was in, there was a sort of commander of the barracks that he was uh, living in, who decided that he wanted to, I don't know, burnish his reputation by forcing all of the Jewish boys in that particular barracks to convert, to get baptized. Um, and, you know, these boys were terrified. They were alone. They were completely vulnerable. And so all of them did, all except for two. My father and this friend of his, a wonderful man who went on to become a surgeon by the name of Nori Kerenyi. And my father refused to be baptized uh, against his will, although it would have been the easier choice. Um, and what made it, I think, quite striking is that at that time, my father was not a particularly religious man, a uh, boy, really. He was a teenager. Um, you know, he, he had a, a belief in God, but he was by no means someone you would consider to be deeply religious. So it wasn't so much his religiosity that I think kept him from doing the easier thing by just agreeing to, to be baptized. I think my father, even at that young age, understood that something very fundamental about his inherent dignity, his right, if you will, to possess his own soul would be forever lost if he allowed himself to be um, tormented and bullied into this. And, uh, you know, he was beaten quite badly for his refusal. Ultimately, he escaped um, from this slave labor camp, made his way back um, to Budapest, where he found a, a, a place in a so-called safe house established by the great humanitarian Raoul Wallenberg. But as I look back, I, I sort of think that in some ways, the qualities that eventually made my father such a passionate and powerful advocate for the rights of others sort of began at that very profound and dark moment in his life where he kind of took a stand that nobody else understood that he was taking that stand, but he took a stand for his own dignity, for his own right to live his life according to the dictates of his own conscience. So anyway, you know, when you're the daughter of Holocaust survivors, that certainly <laughs> impacts very profoundly how you view the world. And uh, when my dad was elected to Congress, uh, he just knew that in addition to the regular things a congressperson does, you know, the constituent service and, you know, fighting for, you know, the environment and for, you know, just the whole range of issues that you care about, that he really needed and wanted to somehow stand up for people who had no one to stand up for them in the way that too few in the world stood up for the Jewish people when they were alone and targeted and persecuted. And so uh, he really made human rights kind of the centerpiece of, of his service in Congress. As I, as I mentioned, he established the Congressional Human Rights Caucus, which after he passed away was renamed um, in his honor, the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission. And so I have a rather proud legacy, as I say, my mom, who is also just a force of nature, um, she is uh, brilliant and beautiful and charming and indefatigable and all of those things. And uh, 
she really worked um, sort of full time as an unpaid executive uh, director of the of the Congressional Human Rights Caucus. And so from both angles, I just have this wonderful family legacy of um, of sort of being one's brother, one's brother's keeper, one's sister's keeper that, you know, this is a moral duty each of us has. Well, and you ended up in the same field of human rights. And so tell me a little bit about, obviously that motivated you, but um, with your work with the Lantos Foundation, how did that inspire you to, to do that? And the, the type of work that the Lantos Foundation does to address these issues? Well, um, going back, you know, before sort of the Lantos Foundation ever existed, um, in the late 1990s and to the beginning of the 2000s, um, my family, our, we were all living in Denmark because um, my husband had been tapped to serve as the U.S. ambassador to Denmark. And I'll give you a little flavor of my adorable and charming mother. So when we were, when we found out we were going to Denmark, everybody was calling and congratulating us. And we felt like, gosh, we had, you know, hit the jackpot. This was going to be so exciting. And the one person who sounded a cautionary note was my mother, who has a very delightful Hungarian accent. And she called and, you know, we were just high as a kite. And she said, oh, darling, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And I said, mom, what do you mean you're so sorry? We're about to have the best adventure of our lives. And she said, oh, yes, the time when you are in Denmark will be wonderful, but it will be a big, big come down when it's over, you know. And she said, so I have some advice for you. And then she went on to say, and it was very good advice. She said, you know, while you're there, whether it's two years, three years, three and a half years, you need to do something serious and substantive that you can bring back with you from Denmark. Because she said, you know, it's easy. You go as an ambassador's wife. It's kind of easy just to get caught up in the social fun of it and the excitement and the you know, honor of representing your country, but that comes to an end and then you come back to real life. And she was really the first to suggest at that time that I should consider pursuing a PhD. So being a good daughter, I thought, you know what? My mom's never led me astray. And so I did um, end up deciding to get my PhD while I was in Denmark. And I decided to do it specifically focused on human rights. And so I wrote my PhD dissertation on the subject of human rights and American foreign policy and analyzing the unique role that the US Congress had played in incorporating human rights as a matter of law, as a principal goal of US foreign policy. It really was the first country to do, the, do that as a matter of sort of legislative initiative. So I began to get very engaged as a human rights activist after that, after completing my PhD, I began teaching human rights and American foreign policy at Tufts and, you know, had been involved um, while we were in Denmark on some human rights issues, specifically around um, trafficking in women. But then when my dad passed away, the family, my mother, my sister, myself, we just knew that, that he had something of a singular legacy. He was and will always be the only survivor of the Holocaust ever elected to Congress. He led uniquely um, on that right set of issues because of the unique circumstances of his life. And, and he believed so passionately in the importance of having those values front and center in our foreign policy. So as a family, we said, you know, we wanna try and keep this legacy going. So that's when we established the foundation. And, um, and it's been um, working and growing and, and hopefully making a difference now for over 13 years. And, uh, you know, we cover a range, of, a range of areas. I should pause for a minute, perhaps. I don't want to just talk endlessly, but I'm, I'm happy later to talk a little more about our work. Oh, I would love to hear more about the Lantos Foundation's work because you've, I mean, you've helped so many prisoners, you've done um, policy issues. I mean, you've done so much. And I think it's important for everyone to hear because like you said, your father was so unique. And sadly, we do not have very many Holocaust survivors with us anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, regardless of where they are, we just don't have that many. And that perspective is so important. You know, it's interesting because I, my first career was actually as a teacher. And in my first Right before I went into teaching, I had studied in Strasbourg, France at the International Institute for Human Rights. And then I later I went on and did my master's in human rights. But 
when I was first teaching, I did uh, my master's in education on human rights education to look at what the impact was. And I remember, you know, at the time, most of the educational materials were in Holocaust education. And so it was so valuable for us to, to use it as a model of explaining how people go from point A to point Z. How can civilians end up committing genocide against a population that they knew that were neighbors and friends? I mean, I, I just think it, it's so unfathomable for people to understand, and especially the farther removed you are from it. And so I remember studying that and then applying it to a broad range of human rights issues in my classroom as we were, as we were studying everything from the U.S. Constitution and the foundation of our inalienable rights all the way down to, you know, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and what happened at the United Nations and our response to the Holocaust and establishing a basis of human rights. But I remember that that perspective was so valuable and it's so easy for people to forget it. And so having, you know, whoever you can find that's around you that has um, suffered or experience something like that. It's so, so important for people to listen and hear and to remember, because without that, we just continue to forget. We repeat the same mistakes. We think we, we start to glorify the, the enemies of the Holocaust, the enemies of, of, of Jewish people or minority groups around the world that have been persecuted. When we forget what inspired those people and motivated those people and the little steps that they took to dehumanize other people. And so um, I just, I mean, I, the fact that I got to serve under your father when he was uh, there and even passed legislation that never would have passed had it not been for him. Mm -hmm. um, and I can share that in a minute, but it, you know, it's so valuable. So I would love to hear more about the Lantis Foundation. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I, I'm always eager to talk about sort of some of the areas where we work in our initiatives, but um, what you just said um, sort of inspires me to want to share just briefly a little bit about um, what both of my parents experienced that helped them not to lose their faith in humanity, despite what they experienced during the war. So hopefully some of your audience have heard of the great Swedish humanitarian Raoul Wallenberg. Um, he was perhaps the greatest humanitarian of the Second World War, a distinguished Swede from one of the wealthiest and most powerful families in Sweden. And um, people should remember that Sweden was neutral during the Second World War and was able to maintain its neutrality. And so Raoul Wallenberg, this handsome, trained as an architect, he actually studied in the United States, he could have easily sat out the war from the safety and comfort of neutral Sweden. But at the, at the height of, of sort of the last phase of the Second World War, he left that, that safe little enclave to go to Hungary with one mission, and that was to try and save as much of the remaining Jewish community as possible. And he came into the hell that was um, sort of wartime Budapest in the last days of the war. This was in 1944. Hungary was occupied by Germany on March 19th, 1944, and Wallenberg arrived in the summer. By that time, almost all of the Jewish population from the countryside had already been rounded up and deported to their deaths in the gas chambers. But the population in and around Budapest was still largely intact. And Wallenberg is credited with perhaps saving as many as 100,000 Jewish lives. And my parents were among those 100,000. And he did it, you know, I sometimes say, especially when I'm talking to diplomats, um, and I love, you know, the world of diplomacy. My husband was a diplomat for a while, and it's it's such an important world. But I sometimes remind people that Wallenberg, who went to Hungary as a diplomat, succeeded in saving all these lives, not because he abided by diplomatic protocols, but because he shredded them. He did, you know, things that he was not authorized to do, that he was not supposed to do, but he saw the need. He saw that he was the only hope for these, um, these um, you know, over 100,000 Jews who were facing um, inevitable deportation and death. And so he invented these protective passports, which were really 
little more than a piece of paper, but it alleged that the bearer of that passport had been given permission to emigrate to Sweden and was under the protection of the Royal Swedish government. He rented buildings around the city where he hung the flag of the Swedish legation and sort of, again, declared them to be part of the Swedish embassy, which gave them a measure of protection. That's where my father found refuge, was in a Wallenberg safe house. They were called safe houses. There were periodic raids on them because the Germans suspected and knew what was going on. And whenever Wallenberg would hear of a raid, you know, he would rush there to try and stop it. He must have had tremendous personal charisma because stories are told of him going to the railway station when he would hear about trains that were getting ready to leave. And he would demand to see the German commander in charge. And he would say, you know, I'm from the Swedish embassy. I have information that you have people under the protection of my government on this train. It will be an international scandal if you don't let me identify them. And then, you know, they were intimidated by him. So he would go to the trains and he'd say, I'm Raoul Wallenberg from the Swedish embassy. If you have a Swedish protective passport, come with me, Get, show it to me and come with me. And people would have them and he literally sort of pulled them off the trains. But then, you know, he couldn't bear to leave behind people. Of course he had to, but he'd say, if you have any sort of a document indicating, you know, that you have a, a connection to Sweden, let me examine it. And People were smart and they would begin pulling out laundry tickets from their pocket, you know, and of course the Germans couldn't read Hungarian and he'd examine them and say, yes, yes, and pull a few more from death to life. Um, so he was a, a remarkable person. My mother says that they called him their Moses from the North, from the North, you know, that who had come to, to save them. And he was a legend. Um, but I think that his example of solidarity with his fellow human beings. They had nothing in common. He was rich, most of them were poor. He was Lutheran, they were Jewish. He was Swedish, they were Hungarian. He was privileged and they were totally vulnerable and persecuted, but they shared this common humanity. And that's what Raoul Wallenberg saw. And that experience of somebody willing to make such sacrifices um, for people with whom he had very little in common other than that shared humanity, really sort of, as I say, rescued my parents' um, belief in the goodness of human beings, belief in the possibility that one person could make a difference, that the light can shine in the darkness. And so, um, you know, I feel just this huge enormous debt of gratitude to Wallenberg. I'm sitting here in my office, your audience can't see it, but a beautiful portrait of Wallenberg, you know, looks down at me from, from that wall of, of my office. And in one of those beautiful moments in life that maybe it's serendipity, but maybe it's more than that. Um, Raoul Wallenberg was born on August 4th. There is a saying um, in the Jewish tradition that he who takes a life, it's as if he killed a whole world, but he who saves a life, it's as if he saved a whole world. Well, many, many years after Wallenberg disappeared, kidnapped by the Soviets, died in the Soviet gulag somewhere, but we still don't know all the facts surrounding it. Um, on his birthday, my first granddaughter was born. And when her name is uh, Nellie Isabella Hedquist, and when she was born, I just that phrase, you know, he who saves a life, it's as if he saved a world, somehow felt like it had come to a kind of completion because Wallenberg saved my father in a safe house. He saved my mother because she got a protective passport. Hers was Portuguese because he had rallied others in the diplomatic community to follow his lead. They had two daughters, their daughters had children. And then my granddaughter was born on his birthday. So kind of a, a beautiful uh, completion of a, of a circle. Yeah. But anyway, um, back to some of the work of the foundation. So we are involved in, in, a, in a number of areas. We um, have 
an initiative around internet freedom. We helped form a coalition called Voices for Internet Freedom because we really believe that internet freedom is sort of the one of the key new frontiers when it comes to human rights. Um, China, Iran, a number of um, oppressive, repressive authoritarian governments really view control of the internet as key to being able to maintain their um, completely repressive control of their countries. Um, so we work as part of a coalition to encourage our government to do more to support internet freedom. You know, there are lots of really amazing software designers and tool inventors who are coming up with, um, with uh, programs and tools to enable people in closed societies to circumvent for example, the Great Firewall of China, to have encrypted, protected communications, to avoid censors. Um, and so we sort of say that this digital curtain that China has, uh, has created in, in our century is sort of like the old Berlin Wall, the old Iron Curtain um, that Winston Churchill spoke about so memorably descending over Europe. And so that's a big area of focus for us, internet freedom. We believe that the rule of law is absolutely central to the protection of human rights. And so we have a number of rule of law initiatives, one of which is an annual rule of law lecture that we do in conjunction with the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins um, University. We, uh, my dad was always a wonderful mentor trying to, um, encourage the next generation of human rights leaders. And I'm talking with one of them now. So, you know, I, I would view you as sort of an example of someone who was mentored and influenced by my father. And so we established the Lantos Congressional Fellows Program, which brings fellows from uh, a number of countries. Um, we've had fellows from Denmark, from Germany, from France, from Hungary, from Israel from Scotland, um, I'm sure I'm missing some places, some American fellows as well. We bring them to the Congress to do a five month fellowship in the Congress in a congressional office with an orientation on human rights. And some of them have gone on to, um, you know, really notable work. We have a former Lantos Congressional Fellow who's now a member of the European Parliament, leading journalists and others. So that's kind of an exciting program. It's been on a bit of a hiatus now, obviously with COVID and some other things. Um, and, uh, oh gosh, you know, there, well, another initiative that I should mention, because this is coming up just next month. Um, and that is uh, sort of in the field that you operate, it um, relates to freedom of religion, conscience and belief. So we call it our annual Solidarity Sabbath Initiative. And it began with a focus on the rising anti-Semitism in Europe. And our very first Solidarity Sabbath was while President Obama was still in office. And our goal that year was to get as many top leaders in Europe and North America to celebrate um, their, their Jewish community and celebrate their solidarity with the Jewish community by participating in some way um, in a sort of Sabbath service. And we were pretty thrilled because we were um, able to um, get President Obama at that time to attend a synagogue. Um, this, he was the first uh, American president, I think since, gosh, I wanna say Ulysses S. Grant. Anyway, it went back a long way to, to go and attend a service um, as president at a, at a, you know, um, at a house of worship. Um, but we, have, we broadened the Solidarity Sabbath initiative to include a variety of initiatives the focus is always showing solidarity with um, communities that are facing persecution. Uh, this year, we are actually um, going to be doing, a, I think, a very exciting program. So I encourage your um, listeners to, to check it out on our website. But we are going to be partnering, partnering with an organization um, called the Combating Anti-Semitism Movement to screen a really beautiful documentary um, called Passage to um, Sweden. And it's about the efforts of the Danish people, the Swedish people and others in Scandinavia um, to try and rescue Jews and provide um, a safe haven for them. So it should be very good. It's gonna be taking place in May and we would love to have 
um, your, your audience join us. And then I'll just mention one other thing. And that is that we um, each year award the Lantos um, Prize for Human Rights to um, a notable human rights leader. And it's been a really wide range of laureates. We've had everyone from His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, Father Patrick Dubois, um, who, who was um, you know, a French, uh, French priest who has worked on uncovering and telling the story of what he calls the Holocaust by bullets. Mm -hmm. um, we have had uh, Vian Dahil, a leader of the um, Yazidi community. We're very excited because our 2020 laureate, we're going to be giving the prize in 2021. Again, due to COVID, we, we didn't want to turn it into a virtual event. So we're going to, to make the actual award this year, but we'll be Brian Stevenson of um, Just Mercy fame and the Equal Justice Initiative. We felt that most of all of our other laureates have really been international figures, but we felt that um, this year with all of the self-reflection and introspection going on in our country about the ways in which we also need to be mindful of, of where we have fallen short of our ideals and our principles in this country, that it really was, um, was important to honor somebody who had fought for justice and fought for human rights within the American legal system. Uh, you know, America has been a leader on human rights globally, um, for a long time, certainly since the adoption of the Universal Declaration, but some of the events of the last period of time have um, have put us back somewhat on our heels. And so we thought that this was a good moment to, to look inward. Um, my father used to say that you could describe American history as a, a difficult but a hopeful story of generation by generation closing what he sometimes called the hypocrisy gap. Mm -hmm. And the hypocrisy gap in his mind was the gap between the extraordinary soaring ideals that um, are at the foundation of this country's founding and are represented in the Declaration of Independence and in our constitution and in so much of what animated the foundation of this country but where we know we so often fell short and a difficult story as he would say, but hopeful because I think the wonderful thing about America is that generation after generation, we have been closing that hypocrisy gap. It's not fully closed. We have to be, you know, humbly um, mindful of that fact, but also ready to be confident and proud of the progress we've made and not afraid to, to also proclaim the ways in which we have stood up for these very, very profound values. Well, I, as, I, as I'm listening to all of the things you're doing, I'm just, I'm amazed. And I'm so encouraged, especially because it's, it's interesting how so much of it aligns with the timeliness of right now in this period of history from internet freedom. And we're gonna be having you know, a decision coming out of Facebook soon, but, you know, as I do around the world, social media has really become a vehicle for people that didn't have a voice to have one. And it's in closed societies where it even teaches them this idea of freedom of expression and of conscience in a way that they haven't been permitted to have in their own societies where, you know, like what's happening in, in Myanmar right now, they shut down the internet, they shut off your ability to have a voice. We've seen this in China with the firewall. We've you know, the, the lack of information coming out of there and what's really happening to the Uyghur community, uh, you know, and every other community, we, um, the lack of information coming out of North Korea. And yet the more information that does get in there, uh, people are beginning to open up and realize that they've been living in darkness and not with the freedoms that they deserve, that they're hardwired to have. So this is a really interesting moment, I think in time and in our history for, you know, for humanity really allowing for that freedom of conscience and expression to, to continue and flourish, or are we going to stifle it and how do we understand and respond to it? So it's so tied into, you know, internet freedom and every other freedom that you're working towards. Um, but I know having worked on these issues and so when it was actually, so Frank Wolf was the co-chair for the human rights, um, 
caucus with your father. And he is the one that actually recruited me to come work in Congress. And it was because within that caucus, he wanted to start a religious freedom working group that would focus specifically on these freedom of conscience issues that post 1998, after the International Religious Freedom Act came about, he felt like there wasn't a broad bipartisan coalition for that. And so I, I had the privilege of coming and building essentially a bipartisan caucus that ended up working just on this issue. And it was amazing to me because it, when things become partisan or just become promoted by one party, we do a disservice to the people we're there to serve because you know, people that are in Myanmar or in China or you name it that are suffering don't see Republican and Democrat. They simply say America is this ideal. It's this, you know, the city on a hill that we want to get to that we want that, that gives us hope for freedom. And so if someone in America remembers me as someone in America, like your father or Frank Wolf or someone else says my name in Congress or writes my name in a bill or asks the State Department about me or asks their their embassy about me, I won't be forgotten. I'll be remembered. And it gives them that hope to keep going and it allows them the strength to, to continue, but also it's a check on the power of their government towards how they're treating them because they know that someone in the world cares and is watching someone with, with authority and with a priority of human rights in their foreign policy, as you mentioned. And it was so, so remarkable to see how many people were were touched as a result of that working group within you know the 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 Lantos and Wolf kind of caucus and then later the Lantos Commission um, to be able to find the freedom and dignity that they deserve that your father had experienced losing firsthand and fighting so hard for and so it, it's it's so remarkable to have been able to serve in that in that body and to be able to do that for people around the world and it's so important that you carry on that tradition around the world because we still need it today, if not more than ever. It, it doesn't it doesn't just stop. And I can imagine that there were times when your father was fighting for human rights and for the rights of people, and it probably wasn't very easy in Congress. And so I don't know if you have a story you'd like to share about that, but I'm sure it was pretty hard. Well, you know, it often was hard. And I think that part of the challenge is that people like to invoke the cause of human rights, but it's also very easy to sort of sideline it. Um, and and it can be hard to, to sort of muscle those considerations into the sort of more real politique calculations of policymakers, whether at the State Department or in an administration. And I know my father really used to believe that it was critically important that the United States lead from its strength. And our great strength historically has been that we are a values-based society, that we you know, don't identify primarily as a nation built on a common you know, religious heritage or a common ethnic heritage. We really are, I know it's not as, as popular nowadays to hark back to this understanding of America, but we really have been somewhat uniquely in world history, a bit of a melting pot, a nation of immigrants. You know, um, Senator Kennedy wrote that uh, wonderful book, A Nation of Immigrants, that made us very unique. And so what binds together a country like that? If you don't all speak, you know, come from the same ethnic background or geographic background or same religious heritage, and it really is sort of coming around these common shared values. Um, and, uh, and my father believed very much that America was going to be at its strongest, at its most successful when we led from our values. But, uh, but it, it was difficult, although I will say this, and, and this is sort of a plea from my heart because I am so troubled whenever I see human rights, religious freedom, international religious freedom becoming a politicized partisan issue. It's absolutely contrary to sort of the heart of the human rights project. And my father, you know, would often tell me, look, I'm a liberal Democrat, but some of my closest collaborators and eventually dearest friends are very conservative Republicans because we see 
a common cause, whether we're fight, writing, fighting for the rights of, of uh, you know, the church, house church movement in China, or for the Tibetans um, who are being crushed by, by uh, the Communist Party of China, whether it was the comfort women um, who were seeking to get recognition and apology and acknowledgement for their abuse during second, the Second World War. Of course, the fight on behalf of Soviet Jewry. Um, and on and on and on, you know, there's so many issues. I know you worked with my dad on, on human rights issues in India. And, and that is a message he tried to carry over and over again. We may disagree about tax policy. We may disagree about the environment. We may disagree about, you know, about, you know, this or that domestic policy issue, but we can link arms and walk forward together on these international human rights causes. And we've really got to get back to that. These should be unifying issues. I'll tell a funny story from many years ago, and I, I won't maybe get it 100% right, but it's a great story that, and I'll ask um, forgiveness in advance for my slightly salty language. I don't really use a lot of salty language. I'm pretty, pretty well behaved, but the story is told that um, many, many years ago, at um, one of the Democratic National Conventions, they had sort of the platform committee was working on a platform um, for the, the party. And, um, and Daniel Patrick Moynihan, Senator Moynihan was kind of on the portion of the platform writing committee that was dealing with sort of the human rights plank in the platform. And he said something to the effect to some of his um, counterparts who, you know, he was sort of a little more moderate to conservative Democrat in terms of being particularly focused on the abuses by, um, you know, sort of the communist countries and others who were more concerned about the human rights abuses of right wing brutal dictators. And he said, I'll tell you what, you be against all the bastards we hate and we'll be against all the bastards you hate, you know, and it was sort of, but that was kind of the, the gist of it, that we might, we might be concerned about different sets of human rights issues, but we're all kind of on the same team when it comes to saying, hey, you know, we're not going to let the bad guys crush dignity, crush rights, crush freedom. And we we do need to, I, I hope we can, this is really, as I say, a plea from the heart, I hope we can have um, a human rights policy that is is broad enough and inclusive enough that it it becomes a source of, of common ground for people who otherwise might not share a lot in common. That's what it should be. And I have a passionately bipartisan and nonpartisan approach to human rights. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate that because it was so encouraging to me to see, we had over 60 members in the end of this caucus, but wow. half Republican, wow. half Democrat, which never happens. They were so effective. It was one of the few caucuses that, you know, like the Human Rights Commission actually got things done. And, you know, it, it, this is, I don't think people can fully appreciate like I can. When we did the India resolution with your father, he had a young Sikh staffer, foreign policy staffer working with him who as a minority in India understood the issues and was willing to take it on um, with the congressman. But, but most congressmen on both sides of the aisle were not willing to take on India. It was, it, most groups will not fund any projects in India. India denies visas to people of the U.S. Congress that try to make any kind of criticism of the country. So, and I'm sure you've seen things when you were at the U.S. Commission on Religious Freedom, what happens when you try to, you know, challenge human rights violations. But they, you know, I mean, the things happening in India are pretty severe. I mean, the, the sitting prime minister, you know, was responsible for a genocide in his state against the Muslim community in Gujarat. Uh, you had one of the worst attacks on Christians in world history happen um, in Kandamal when I was, you know, working on this legislation. I, I mean, it's, and the violations go on and on and you have these love jihad honor killings against Muslim girls. I mean, it's, it's horrific what's happening there. It's 1.2 billion people. So one of the second largest country in the world and some of the worst violations of human rights in the world are actually happening in India. It's, most people might think it's the Middle East. No, it's actually India, um, you know, proportionately. And so he was willing to take it on and to, you know, we, we wrote a resolution that we tried to, you know, not, it wasn't to condemn the Indian government. It was to say, 
hey, we care about the untouchables, the Dalits, the Adivasas, these, these lower castes that are being severely attacked by extremist groups with impunity. And let us help you come alongside to build a culture of respect for the rights of the smallest community. Because really, as we know here in America, and as we've seen elsewhere, you know a true democracy by how it treats its smallest communities. And so being our strongest democratic ally, no one wanted to touch it, but we were willing to, he was willing to take this on and to do it. And just as, just as, so people understand the, the, the difference, a couple years later, when he was not the chair, when he, he had passed away and he was not the chair and there was a Republican chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, um, that gentleman actually threatened to have people that introduced resolutions on India removed from their chairmanships. So it really, I think, I don't people, I don't think people fully understand or can appreciate the valor and the courage that it takes to champion human rights like your father and so many others that we know did up there. And, um, and coming from the place in his experience, it means so much. And it's such an example that we need in our country. And so, it, you know, it's remarkable, but you were going to say something. Well, Katrina. first of all, I want to thank you for sharing that story because it, it's a powerful one. And it reminds me of another similar example where, well, I'll mention two. One was when my father gave his full backing to the Armenian genocide resolution. And, you know, at that time, all of the kind of tough, smart, again, real politique foreign policy people were saying this, we absolutely can't do this. Turkey will go ballistic. Turkey is, you know, a key NATO ally. We need Turkey for this reason, this reason, this reason, this reason. And, you know, they had their arguments. But my father said, you know, those things may all be true. But at the end of the day, if we don't stand up for the historical truth that there was an Armenian genocide, we are betraying ourselves. We are betraying our most fundamental values. And there was a lot of a lot of um, objection and criticism to him throwing his support behind that resolution, but because he did carry a lot of weight, because he was the only Holocaust survivor, it played a critical role. Another sort of more amusing example, um, but, but also just kind of goes to show how sometimes, you know, the traditional establishment, whether it's an administration, you know, in the State Department or the White House. I understand it. They don't want to rock the boat. And uh, many, many years ago, my goodness, this would have been in the early 1980s, my father um, issued the first formal invitation from the U.S. Congress to His Holiness the Dalai Lama to come and speak to the Congressional Human Rights Caucus. And, you know, he had notified the State Department that he was going to do this. And they really did go ballistic. They were like, you cannot do this. This is going to blow up in our faces. This is going to infuriate the Chinese. You know, we are pleading with you not to do it. And as my mother very cutely um, says, um, she says, um, but my husband told the State Department to go fly a kite. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and the Dalai Lama came. And yes, China was furious. But you know what? It's not the worst thing in the world when we infuriate China over their outrageous human rights abuses. And in this instance, their brutal oppression of Tibet. I don't think people realize how many Tibetans have been killed over the years you know, the many decades that, um, that that country has been really crushed by China. And, um, you know, the Dalai Lama came and it was really sort of open the, the floodgates, if you will, for a wide spectrum of society in the West and in the United States to say, you know, we're going to no longer be intimidated and, and not accord this remarkable world figure and religious leader, sort of the, the respect and the forum that he deserves. Um, so, you know, my father, one, one good thing about having endured very difficult things in your youth is it does make you sort of fearless. Everything, it, it always, you know, was in perspective for him. He used to love to say, Tina, whenever something difficult or terrible was going on, he had this great line, he'd say, 
I, and you know, I, I love to imitate my parents' accent. So I, um, I, I always kick into saying it the way he said it, but he would say to me, darling, don't worry. We are just bending a windy corner of history. And right around this corner will be blue skies and wonderful possibilities. And um, I loved that because it reflected sort of a, a toughness, but also just a bright optimism, that there was always this optimism there. It, yeah, this is a windy corner. We're getting blown around a little bit. This is a, a tough corner, but we're going to get around this corner and there are going to be bright skies and wonderful possibilities. So he was very inspiring in that way. And I think he really did inspire his colleagues. I know when he passed away, so many of them, they had a beautiful kind of um, congressional service for him where members could come and, and pay tribute. And so many of them would say things like, you know, Tom Lantos was the conscience of, of the Congress. He really uh, elevated our dialogue. And, and, you know, he would also often say to his colleagues, look, I've experienced um, brutal oppression of the right under the fascists. And I've experienced bad oppression from the left under the communists. The key thing is freedom. And we should remember in this country that what unites us is far, far more significant than what divides us. And people really knew that when he said that it came from the gut. And, and so I think he was able to be a real influence for coming together and for good amongst his colleagues. If only we could have that courage today. So yeah. it's, 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 it's an inspiration. And I remember that your mother used to come to all of our hearings that we organized for the caucus. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even the staff briefings that weren't, you know, with members there, but she was such a, a hero and, and you're right. She was always there. There's no, um, no other member of Congress's spouse has been at more events than she has. And I mean, they were, they were like a team and it was uh, just, I love your mother. So please tell her to say hello. I, and, shall. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's so neat to, to kind of reminisce related to some of the work you're doing today and the focus on anti-Semitism and kind of going back to that you've experienced, I mean, I remember at the beginning of last year, before there was COVID, uh, you know, one of the first things that brought us into the new year was an attack on a church in Texas in 2020, but then also this attack at a, at a rabbi's home where he was celebrating Shabbat dinner. And it was, you know, just terrifying that somebody wouldn't, it, it, I mean, they literally are going into the homes now and targeting Jewish people, but anti-Semitism has grown worldwide, it's gotten far worse in Europe and in America. Most people are not paying attention to this. Um, and then I think, I can't remember if it was 2020 or 2019 that there was the attack at the synagogue in San Diego as well. But this is an ongoing thing where we're beginning to see that places of worship, but in particular, uh, you know, related to anti-Semitism, synagogues are not off limits anymore. And it's got to, but it, but it's actually gotten more vicious. And so you had a personal story you were going to share that I'd love to just hear because it's really we've seen even in the US Congress how much more visceral this has become when when your father was there and even when Joe Lieberman was there. It was such a different tone and um, you know there was a there was a very clear separation between political differences and anti Semitism and it seems like those lines have become really blurred. Yeah, well, I did have an interesting experience a few years ago. I had been asked to come and speak at a university, um, a, a forum they were having on religious freedom. And I was quite um, shocked and appalled because one of the speakers prior to me had um, told some absolutely outrageous and deeply slanderous um kind of tall tales about Israel that were absolutely non-factual and absurd and uh, had gone sort of unchallenged, but they were just really outrageous. And um, so when it came my turn to speak, I thought, you know, I have to address this before I give my regularly scheduled remarks as it is. So I sort of stood up and, and said, you know, I think I need to um, address uh, some of the things that were said by one of the earlier speakers, because I think they are an example of what we are coming to recognize and call the new anti-Semitism, which is um, the same old 
um, virulent and poisonous hatred of the Jewish people, but um, sort of attempting to falsely wrap itself in a cloak of anti-Zionism. So, you know, hostility to Israel, hostility um, to the Jewish state, uh, but somehow some people seem to feel that that gives them a, a, a certain protection from being accused of anti-Semitism. And I just pointed out at that time that our State Department had adopted um, a definition of this new anti-Semitism. This was before the IRA definition, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance developed a, a definition of anti-Semitism that is similar to the one that at that time was being used in our State Department. And it identified sort of what I call the three Ds, um, demonization, delegitimization, and double standards. So and we all recognize that uh, you know, Israel is a subject to criticism as any other country, including our own. And it is absolutely not anti-Semitism when people say we don't like this policy or we disagree with that policy or we don't think that's a great political leader. 100% legitimate, 100% fine. And part of, you know, just the rough and tumble of what life is. But when attacks on the only Jewish state, if you will, the Jew among the nations of the world are characterized first by delegitimization. So somehow saying that this disagreement or that mistake that, that the country of Israel made somehow calls into, its question, calls into question its right to exist, that's a warning sign. So, you know, if Canada or England or Italy or any country, Taiwan, Korea does something reprehensible, People don't get up and say, Korea doesn't have a right to exist. There should be no Korea. There should be no Italy. But if something happens in Israel that people find objectionable, again and again, you hear the very legitimacy of Israel called into existence. So delegitimization. The second is demonization. It is fine, again, to criticize any country. But when it devolves into these, this ugly pattern of demonization, accusing Israel of being an apartheid state, a Nazi state. Um, it is sickening, it's outrageous. And once again, the flag goes up saying, no, this is not normal disagreement. This is, this is just flat out anti-Semitism. And then the third, double standards. So when Israel alone among the nations, a tiny democratic country with a remarkable level of human rights and civil rights and political rights for its um, entire population, including women's rights and LGBTQ rights, et cetera, et cetera. When it alone among the panoply of countries in the world is again and again and again and again singled out for attacks and criticism. And the UN is notorious for this and the UN Human Rights Council, very notorious for this. Um, then again, that third flag goes up and you know, this is not just normal critique and give and take. This is the new manifestation of anti-Semitism. And then we have, of course, traditional anti-Semitism of the right and now of the far left. And it's it's terrifying to me. I think there was, I don't think that anti-Semitism ever went away, Tina, but I think in the aftermath of the Holocaust, that greatest um, tragedy against a single people in human history, there was sort of a, a shame factor that drove it underground, but somehow now as, as, as it's receding from memory, as that generation is passing from the scene, it's as though the old demon has been released again. I was horrified and appalled to read yesterday that um, a court in France just ruled conclusively that the murderer of a beautiful elderly Holocaust survivor who was massacred in her apartment by a young man um, who, uh, you know, it clearly was a hate crime. He stabbed her to death repeatedly. Her screams were heard throughout the apartment building, and then he threw her body off the balcony to her death. Um, he will face no charges because he had had, and, and the phrase that the French court used, somebody will have to look it up, but it was an absurd phrase, something like he had had a delirious puff of marijuana. Literally, that was sort of the language they used. And so he wasn't fully in command of all of his senses. And so there will be no accountability, no justice for what was clearly a murderous anti-Semitic hate crime. Um, 
And, you know, you have in places like France, but it's increasingly true on US college campuses. If a young Jewish person um, is inclined to wear a, a kippah, you know, or a Star of David, they fear and worry that they will be harassed and targeted. You have had um, in this country and far worse in Europe, um, uh, you know, just, just social pressures that make it difficult to simply be Jewish. And of course, relating to the sort of new anti-Semitism I spoke about, um, you've had, uh, you know, young college students elected to, you know, student council or, you know, student government who are attacked and driven out of office because they support Israel. Um, you know, it's, right. it's appalling and terrifying. And what most people don't understand is that the most persecuted group proportionately in the world are actually people of the Jewish faith. It's true. It's yeah. Many community. I, I know we are kind of running out of time, but I wanted to just finish with one story that you have from your time at the US Commission on Religious Freedom, because I think it's so relevant. You know, we, we wanna break the misconceptions that people have about freedom of conscience and belief and what it looks like for different kinds of people. And I think Myanmar really presents in the last several years, an example that everybody should be able to come together on. Can you share a little, just you know, briefly about what you learned in your time with the commission about how different we can we can understand this, these freedoms based on what's happening in Myanmar. Well, obviously right now it's a catastrophe and a tragedy, but as I'm sure many of your listeners know, for some years now there's been um, unbelievable ethnic cleansing, persecution and genocide being perpetrated against the Rohingya Muslim minority in Myanmar. And I often bring this very heartbreaking situation up when talking to groups because it is, I think, a really important check and reminder to all of us that we must never fall into the dangerous trap of stereotyping any community as being, you know, either um, oppressors or, or, you know, somehow um, unquestioningly virtuous. So, you know, here we have a majority Buddhist country in which a small Muslim minority is really being horribly, horribly um, attacked, killed, raped, tortured, and driven from their homes. And, you know, too often I think people in an unthinking way sort of say, oh, you know, Muslims, they're kind of religious zealots and they are you know, posing a threat to other faith communities. And they simultaneously say, oh, you know, the Buddhists are so peaceful, you know, and so wonderful and what, a, what an embracing peaceful faith community that is. And my point is not to criticize Buddhists or Buddhism as a faith, but to point out that neither should we make assumptions or criticize Muslims or Islam as a faith. It is about the character of the governments, the character of the leaders, the character of the um, you know, social groups that may be agitating for sectarian violence. And I just think that that is a, it's sort of a very grave religious freedom, human rights situation that challenges incorrect, mistaken assumptions um, that people have. And I'll share one more quick story. I realize it may not all get into the, into the podcast, but I think this one's important as well. Because when we talk about defending freedom of religion and belief, that is a human rights cause that embraces not only believers of every um, community and conviction, but also humanists and those whose sincere beliefs cause them not to believe in, in any particular faith. And um, some years ago, when I was still on USURF, uh, there was a, a young um, humanist in Saudi Arabia, Raif Badawi, who was um, charged with blasphemy and other crimes simply for having a blog that, you know, challenged some of the religious orthodoxy and invited free thinking. Um, and he was sentenced to 10 years in prison and a thousand lashes. And a thousand lashes is really a death sentence. Um, so some of us on the commission decided as a means of sort of protesting this outrageous um, sentence 
that we would write to the government of Saudi Arabia and ask if we could um, go there and take lashes in his stead. And word of this got out and we were contacted by thousands of people who were so moved. And it was one of the most moving experiences I had during my entire time on the commission. I can still remember some of the emails where, you know, one darling lady said, you know, I'm not very young anymore. I don't think I could survive much, but I can do one lash. And, you know, another fellow who said, you know, I'm only um, a, a car salesman and a father of three, but my Catholic faith compels me to want to stand with this brother over there and I can scrape together the money and I will fly there to take, you know, 20 lashes for this young man. It was so moving and so powerful. And sadly, Raif Badawi is still in prison. But since that letter and since that outpouring of people sort of protesting on his behalf, he has not been lashed again. And that's a very, very small victory, not enough of a victory, but a small one. And, um, and, and I want to bring that story up because he, he is a believer in agnosticism and humanism who is being persecuted for his beliefs in a highly orthodox religious state. And so this is a broad human right the freedom of religion, conscience, and belief. It encompasses everyone. It speaks to our fundamental right to live our lives in accordance with our convictions and our conscience. And as we've been sharing throughout this whole hour, when you don't have it, when you are denied your ability to think and believe on your own, it denies your fundamental humanity. Exactly. And that's why at Hardwired, that's why we say people are hardwired to believe in something. You know, it doesn't matter what it is, but like we are spiritual beings. That's how we're made. And so to deny that really denies the human spirit. And so you can't, you know, the worst thing that you can do to a person is crush their spirit. And that's what you do when you deny them this freedom. So um, it's, you know, we've mentioned a lot of people and we remember them today in this, in just, you know, this small way, but you have a podcast as well. So I hope that people will listen to it. The keeper, I know we have to run now, but I, we will share it on the end of this as well. So that people have it. And I'm just so grateful for the time that we had together, Katrina. It was so wonderful catching up with you. And I just, I'm, you know, I'm just thrilled to be able to uh, hear all the things that you're doing and will continue to do. Well, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. And thank you for all the work you do upholding the freedom and dignity of people all around the world. Um, we couldn't be engaged in more important or more meaningful or more satisfying work. <laughs>